All right, today we're going to cover the Cambridge International Examinations CIE IGCSE for Physics, Paper 4. This is the Extended Theory exam, and this is for October, November 2018. So the course code is 0625, and this is variant 2, so 0625 slash 42. Right, let's begin. We are on in 7, 6... Five, four, three, two. Question 1. A lorry is travelling along a straight, horizontal road. Figure 1.1 is the distance time graph for the lorry. OK, so key point there, we have a distance time graph. So some useful information can we get from that. The gradient will give us the speed. Now, let's look at the question. A. Using figure 1.1, determine 1. The speed of the lorry at time t equals 30 seconds. OK, so the gradient gives us the speed. Looking at that, it's a large section, which is a straight line. So the gradient here will be the same as the gradient at all these points along the straight line section. So I can come up here. Oops, draw a straight line down there, and that tells me the time is 60 seconds. And at a time of 60 seconds... There we go. I expect it to be at a distance of 1,800 metres. So, because that's a straight line section, I can go to the end of that section there, 60 seconds, 1,800 metres, and calculate the gradient. Go, and that gives me a value of 30 meters per second. Now, of course, you could write that as 30 meters divided by seconds. That's exactly the same thing. All right, and of course, remember to put in your units here because there aren't any units written down at the end of the question. Part 2. The average speed of the lorry between time t equals 60 seconds and t equals 120 seconds. Well, again, we know that the average speed will be the gradient And that'll be the gradient between those two points. So again, change in distance or change in time. And let's look at the values at time t equals 60 and t equals 120. There we are. So at a time of 120 seconds, there we go. We expect to see a distance there. Yep. Of 2700 metres. Okay, so change in distance over change in time. Well, the distance is changing from 2,700 metres minus 1,800 metres. It tells us how much the distance is changed by, and of course the time. Change in time is 120 seconds minus 60 seconds, which will give us 900 metres divided by 60 seconds, which is 15 metres per second. And of course, again, remember the units. B. At time t equals 30 seconds, the total resistive force acting on the lorry is 1.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Using the diagram, the graph, determine the magnitude of the acceleration of the lorry at time t equals 30 seconds. OK, so let's look at t is 30 seconds. At a time t equals 30 seconds, OK, so we have... That's that time here. What we have is a straight line section of a distance time graph. If it's a straight line, that means it's travelling with a constant speed. So we know it's travelling with a constant speed, which means the acceleration will be zero. So let's write that in. Now, let's just be clear about this. We're saying that the speed is constant, so the acceleration is zero. You'll find that these exams do that a lot. They kind of mix and match speed and velocity when it comes to speed, time, and distance time graphs. Just be aware of that. 
So technically I should be looking at a, a velocity situation. So the velocity should be constant. I should have displacement time graph. But they give me a distance time graph and from that I can conclude the acceleration is zero. Two, determine the forward force in the lorry due to its engine at a time t is 30 seconds. Okay, well this acceleration is zero. So F equals m a and a equals zero. Now this is the resultant force. So the resultant force is zero newtons. All right, so if I draw my lorry here, there we are. I have a force. Let's assume our lorry is moving this direction. I have a force acting against it, which is the resistive force. And I'm given a value, 1.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Now I know the resultant force is zero. So that means that the force pushing it forward must also be 1.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons. And that's my answer. 1.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons. There we are. Problem solved. Now, describe the motion of the lorry between time t is 60 seconds and t is 130 seconds. Let's pull that graph back up. So we've been asked to look at this point here along there. We've been asked about what's happening to our lorry during this time. Okay. So what we can see is during this first section here, it's slowing down. It's decelerating. And at this point here, the distance isn't changing anymore. So it's stopped. So between the time of t is 60 seconds and the time of t is 130 seconds, it has slowed down, it's decelerated to a stop. And there we are. The lorry has decelerated to a stop. In terms of where the marks are, I would guess there's one here and one here. We're saying it's slowing down, it's decelerated, and then with the second mark will be for saying it stops. Question 2. Figure 2.1 shows liquid in the cylinder. And there we are, we've got a cylinder with uh, some liquid in it. Let's move on to the next bit. Table 2.1 gives some data about the cylinder and the liquid. And there we are. We've got a bunch of data about the radius, the weight, the depth, and the density. The cylinder containing liquid is placed on a digital balance that displays a mass in kilograms. There we are. So we've got a mass being displayed in kilograms. Calculate the reading shown on the balance. Okay. So it wants us to calculate the reading we expect to see. So what we're looking for there. We want to find the mass, and the mass, the total, would just be the mass of a cylinder plus the mass of the liquid. Right, so let's write that down for the down, and then let's carry out our calculations. Now, we want to calculate the mass of the liquid. That's going to be equal to the density of the liquid multiplied by the volume of liquid that's in the cylinder. And that is just going to be the density of the liquid multiplied by the area of the base multiplied by the height of the liquid. So the information we're given for the base of the cylinder itself is the radius. We know it's a circular shape, so it's just going to be pi r squared. So that we can actually put in all our information here. So our density is 900 kilograms per meter cubed. The area of the base is pi r squared. So that's just going to be pi times uh, it's 3.5 centimeters. But looking at these units here that we have for our density, what we're going to want, we're going to want to convert centimeters to meters. There we are, so 0 0.035 meters squared, that's pi r squared, the area of a circle, times the height of the liquid, and the depth of the liquid we're given is 12.0 centimeters. And that will give us a number of something like 0 0.4156 kilograms. But of course that's way too many significant figures. Looking over here, I've got one significant figure there, and two, three over here, so I'd really want to be doing it to about two significant figures. That gives me about 0 0.42 kilograms. Now, the mass total 
going to be the mass of the cylinder plus the mass of the liquid. So I've got the mass of the liquid, and I can write in that second part, 0 0.42 kilograms. Let's look at the mass of the cylinder. What I'm given is that the weight of the empty cylinder is 2.5 newtons, and I want to find the mass. So I know that weight of the cylinder is mass of the cylinder times gravity. And I know that that is 2.5 newtons. I know that gravity is 10 meters per second squared. Why? Because it's written in the front of this exam paper. Okay, so I want to find the mass of the cylinder. That's going to be the weight of the cylinder, 2.5 newtons divided by gravity, which is 10 meters per second squared. Now give me a value of 0 0.25 kilograms. So there we go, We've got one value there. We've got another value there. Let's add them together. That's going to be 0 0.25 kilograms plus 0.42 kilograms. Give me a final value for the mass of 0 0.67 kilograms. There we are, and that's the final answer. If you look at the mark scheme, you'll see that they've actually put in a different value to this. They've put in 0 0.66 kilograms. And the reason they've done that is they've actually made a mistake. And they've made a mistake when they've calculated out their values for the mass of the liquid here. They've uh, rounded it too soon. You need to obviously calculate the full value and round it at the end. Uh, it's a silly mistake. Should they have done it? Of course not, but it happens. What we have access to, of course, is we have access to the mark scheme. We don't have access to any of the notes that then get sent round the examiners to tell them how to mark the different questions afterwards. So, swings and roundabouts, really. Okay, so the answer should really be 0 0.67 kilograms. They have it in the mark scheme 0 0.66 kilograms because they've made a mistake. All right, to the next part. B, figure 2.2 shows a device that measures the pressure of a gas. Now, state the name of this device. Well, this device is actually called a manometer. So a manometer is one of those ones that's shaped like a little tube. And a barometer is one of those ones that's upended in liquid. This would be a barometer. And a manometer measures the pressure difference between uh, one side and normally the atmosphere. And the barometer measures the pressure of the atmosphere itself. And that is then given by this height, density times gravity times height. All right. Now, let's move down a little bit further. The pressure of gas, uh, the pressure of the gas is 400 pascals greater than atmospheric pressure. Calculate the density of the liquid. There we are. Right, so as I mentioned earlier on, of course, this change in pressure between one side and the other side uh, is going to be given by density times gravity times height. And that means when one side is at one height and another side is at another height, you're interested in this height difference, delta H. There we go. So density times gravity times this height here. So let's put this through. Now, what do we have? We want to find the density of the liquid, rho of the liquid. And that's just going to be the pressure divided by gravity times height. Okay, so let's look at the pressure because of this column of liquid. And there we are, we've given 400 pascals, and gravity, of course, is 10 meters per second squared, and the height we're given is 50 millimeters. So let's convert that to meters 0 0.05 meters. All right, putting that all through. And what we get is this beautiful answer, 800 kilograms meters to the negative three. And again, just so everyone's nice and comfortable with it, if I write kilograms meters negative three, that is exactly the same as kilograms over meters cubed. They're the same thing. They're different ways of writing the same thing. Right, next. With the gas supply connected, the top of the tube on the left of the device is sealed securely with a rubber stopper. And then the gas pressure is increased. Well, okay, let's just look at that in the drawing. So what they're saying here is they're gonna put a rubber bung over the top there, jam it in nice and solid, and it's gonna be at this height difference. The gas supply, they're gonna take the pressure and they're gonna increase it. 
which is going to push down on this with more force. And that means that this is going to move upwards. And the reason it will move upwards is because initially this will be at atmospheric pressure. As it moves upwards, of course, the pressure will increase and increase because the gases get nowhere to go because of this blockage and this big rubber bung, if you will. All right, so let's put that down as our answer. So what's going to happen? Well, the liquid on the left will get higher up. Why? Because the pressure from the gas supply is bigger than the pressure from the liquid due to the different height plus the pressure from the atmosphere. So there we are. The liquid on the left will get higher because the pressure from the gas supply is bigger than the pressure from the liquid at a different height plus the pressure from the atmosphere. Let's just quickly draw a manometer down here. There we are. It doesn't have to be a wonderful manometer. When the levels are equal, if this is, say, a gas supply pushing down on this side, then all that's pushing down on this side is the atmosphere. What does that mean? Well, it means when they're level, they're at the same values. The pressure from the gas supply is equal to the pressure from the atmosphere. As the gas supply pushes further and further down, there we go, we end up with this height disparity. And of course, that pressure difference is given by rho gh. So the pressure from the gas supply in these circumstances would be pressure from the atmosphere plus rho gh, or this change in pressure, delta p, both exactly the same. So that's what's happening there, and that's how we're answering that question. The pressure from the gas supply is bigger than the pressure from the liquid at the different height plus the pressure from the atmosphere, because both of them are acting to push against the gas supply there. All right. Question three. The velocity of an object of mass m increases from u to v. State, in terms of m, u and v, the change of momentum of the object. All right, so what do we know? Well, we know momentum is mass times velocity. So the change in momentum would just be equal to the mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity. So let's just write that down. Now we're given symbols for the initial and final velocity, so that would then just be mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity. Just make sure that your V and your U are different enough for it to be clear. B. In a game of tennis, a player hits a stationary ball with his racket. 1. The racket is in contact with the ball for 6 milliseconds. The average force on a ball during this time is 400 newtons. Calculate the impulse on the tennis ball. So the impulse is equal to the change of momentum, and the change of momentum here is just going to be the average force multiplied by the time that the force acts for. So let's write that down. So there we are, the impulse is just given by the force multiplied by the time that it acts for, which in this case is a 400 newton force multiplied by a time of action of 6 milliseconds. That's 6.0 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. There we are, and that will give us a value of 2.4 newton seconds. Remember the units. Where do they come from? Well, newtons multiplied by seconds. That's it. Leave them in there. Problem solved. So the impulse is then just 2.4 newton seconds. Right. Part 2. The mass of the ball is 0 0.056 kilograms. Calculate the speed with which the ball leaves the racket. All right. Now, if we come back up here, we need to know the initial speed. If we come up a little bit, there we are. A player hits a stationary ball, so the initial speed is zero. So any change in speed will be the speed that it leaves the racket with. Okay, so what do we know? Well, we know that momentum is mass times velocity. We want to find the velocity, so the velocity is just going to be the momentum divided by the mass. Putting the numbers that we already have in there, that's 2.4 newton seconds divided by 0 0.056 kilograms and that gives me a value of 43 meters per second. Oops. There we are. Three. State the energy transfer that takes place. One is a ball changes shape during the contact between the racket and the ball. OK, so the racket has kinetic energy. Now, the ball is changing its physical shape as it gets hit by the racket. That energy is changing into elastic potential energy. 
There we are, so kinetic energy to elastic potential energy. Two, as the ball leaves the racket. Well, as it leaves the racket, the elastic potential energy, that squished ball, the ball is ex expanding, it's changing its shape back to its original form. So the elastic potential energy is becoming kinetic energy. There we go, so the elastic potential energy to kinetic energy. Let's move on to the question four. Question four. Figure 4.1 shows apparatus used by a student to measure the specific heat capacity of ion. There we go, we've got ion bulk, an electric heater, and a thermometer. A. The student improves the accuracy of the experiment by placing material around the block, as shown in figure 4.2. So, let's come down and have a look at that. There we are, figure 4.2. They put material around it. Now, my guess is that that's going to be a good insulator so the heat isn't lost. So one, suggest the name of a possible material the student could use and explain how it would improve the accuracy of the experiment. All right, so what do we know? Well, it's going to be an insulator. There's any insulators you can think of. Foam, uh, rubber, polystyrene. You know what, I'm going to go with foam. You know why I'm not going to go with polystyrene? Because it's an absolute pain to spell. There we are. So clearly, foam would be the best insulator for this, because it's easy to spell. So suggestion of the material? Foam. Explanation? It is a good insulator of heat. And because it's a good insulator of heat, less heat is lost to the surroundings. And of course that means that more energy will be transferred into the block. Now if you notice, I've written two things for the explanation. Why? Because if I'm just suggesting an, uh, suggesting an insulator for the first part, then that can't be worth more than one mark. Which means I need to have the remaining, I've got three in total, the remaining two marks must be in here. So, one, the purpose of the foam, and two, the benefit of the foam. Two, state how the student could further improve the accuracy of the experiment by using more of the material used in figure 4.2. Okay, let's go back up and have a look at the picture again. There we are, we've got a beautiful picture. We're being asked, how could we use more of it? Well, we could put some on top. And if we put some on top, we're going to lose even less energy because then it won't be open to the top section either. And any thermal energy that wants to transfer out the material to the surroundings would have to do it going through the insulation, which would be much more difficult to lose heat that way. Okay. So my final answer here then, put insulation on top of the block. There we go. So put insulation, the foam, on top of the block. B. The current in the heater is 3.8 amps, and a potential difference is 12 volts. The iron block is a mass of 2 kilograms. When the heater is switched on for 10 minutes, the temperature of the block rises from 25 degrees Celsius to 55 degrees Celsius. Calculate the specific heat capacity of the iron. Right, okay, so what do we know? Well, we know that E equals MC delta t or delta theta depending how you've been taught it we can just go through that as a little triangle there we are we want to find c so we cover it over and that tells us the equation that we need to use we need to use that c is given by the energy supply divided by the mass times the change in temperature all right so let's start looking at that and let's write down the information that we actually have already so we know the mass mass is 2.0 kilograms. We know the change in temperature. That's going to be 55 degrees C, the final temperature minus 25 degrees C. And that will give us a value of 30 degrees C. So now what remains is to find the value for the energy going in. All right. So what do we know? We've got an electric heater. We know that energy is power times time. Okay. The time is 10 minutes. The power, well, we're not given power explicitly, so we have to use our equation for power, one of them, which is power is current times voltage. We know the voltage across it is 12 volts and the current in the heater is 3.8 amps. So let's write down our working out here. Let's write it down again. C, the specific capacity, is 
energy supply divided by m delta t. So the energy supplied will be the power times time, that's current, times voltage, I times V times time, which is times uh, 10 minutes. But we don't want it in minutes, we want it in seconds, times 60 seconds in a minute. There we are, and of course, divided by the mass times the change in temperature. This is all information we already have now. So let's put that down. That's going to be 3.8 amps times 12 volts times 10 minutes times 60 seconds in a minute divided by mass times change in temperature. That's 2.0 kilograms times 30 degrees Celsius. Excellent. And there we go. What we have, that's, these are just so, this one here is certainly one significant figure. So I really shouldn't be writing it to more than two significant figures. And that will give me an answer of 460 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Now, if you're curious where the joules come from, it's because the top section is measured in joules, the energy is in joules, and down underneath, of course, we have the mass, which is in kilograms, and that's multiplied by degrees Celsius. So we've got joules divided by degrees Celsius over here for our units. All right, so let's just highlight this a little bit more. Here we go, so I've written down 460 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. If you have a look at the mark scheme for this one, you'll see it's actually 450 joules per kilogram per, cel uh, per degree Celsius. Why? because early in the question, they take this section here and round it to two significant figures. It's not something you're supposed to do. The marks here are all B marks, so doing it either way should still get you the full set of marks available for it. However, the way they did it, it's a little bit of bad practice. And I have to admit, it's, it's, uh, it's an unusual exam paper, because that's twice that they've done that in it so far. All right, but let's write down our final answer. We've got all our working there, so it's clear where everything came from. Joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. All right, let's move on to the next part. Question five. Figure 5.1 shows a visible spectrum focused on a screen by passing light from a source of white light through a lens and a prism. All right. Part one, state the name of the process that separates the colors in the white light. Okay, and this process is called dispersion. There we go. Part two, state the color of the light on the screen at point A and point B. All right, let's come up here and let's look at this picture that we have. Now, up on A, I'll just write this in, will be red. The other side, is towards the blue side of the spectrum, of course, this side ends in the colour violet. Now, a good way to remember this is, if you like, that the sky is blue, but sunsets are red, because when the evening happens, when the sun's starting to go down over the horizon, you can look towards the sun, see the sky all around it is red. And that's light, it's travelling through a lot of atmosphere at that point to get to you. And all the blue light changes direction much more, which is why the sky is blue during the daytime. So there we go. Red and violet. Excellent. Part three, state the property of the glass of the prism that causes white light to be split into the different colors of the spectrum. Now the key point here, of course, is that different colours in glass travel at different speeds. So there we go. Different colours of light travel at different speeds in glass. B. Figure 5.2 shows a section of an optical fibre in air. A ray of light is incident on the fibre wall at X. Part 1 and 5.2 continue the path of the ray of light up to the end of the fiber. Okay, so the key point here is that the light will bounce off the edge of the fiber optic cables. 
and the way that it will do it, if I draw a tangent just about here, not the world's best tangent, but it's okay, there we go. Just to give me an idea of the direction the ray is going to go, I'll end up with a situation where this angle here, theta, is equal to this angle over here from the tangent over to the ray of light. So from that, I can just draw in the next line. And try and make sure those angles are about equal. And I can repeat that process over here. Oops. That's not perfect, but it's just a, a nice model drawing just to try and get it approximately right. There we go. That's it. And of course, what I'll do as well while I'm here is just draw in these little arrows to show the ray of light. What I might do as well, actually, as they're not part of what's being drawn, is just take out oops, the little guidelines that I've put in. That's just for me. There we go. Beautiful. Now, the refractive index of the material of the fibre is 1.46. Calculate the critical angle of the material in the fibre. Oh, hmm. Now, the sign of our critical angle, C, is given by 1 over N. It's one of those equations that you need to remember. So, sign of a critical angle is 1 divided by the value of the refractive index. Which means the value of our critical angle is given by sine to the negative 1 of 1 over n. That's our inverse sine button on the calculator. It's normally something like uh, shift sine will give you that normally. So let's do that. That'd be sine to the negative 1, 1 divided by 1.46. There we go, looking at that, I've got one significant figure here, I've got three significant figures there, so two significant figures for an answer is fine. And that will give me a value of 43.2 degrees, which is 43 degrees. There we go, to two significant figures. Part 3. State two uses of optical fibres. Well, number one, communication. Very important one, that is. So the internet works. And number two, I think probably the best one, best next one would be medical imagery. You can look inside the body using optical fibres. Very useful purpose for them. There we go. Now let's go on to question number six. Question six. Figure 6.1 represents a sound wave of wavelength 0 0.45 metres, travelling from left to right. A. On figure 6.1, add the centre of a compression mark across and label it C. All right then. First things first, let's mark across at the centre of a compression. There we go. We're going to label that C. 2. At the centre of a ray refraction, mark across and label it R. So, right in the middle there is R. And 3. Draw a double-headed arrow to represent a distance of 0 0.9 metres. Now I'm told here that the wavelength is 0 0.45 metres. What does that mean? Well, that means 0 0.45 metres is the distance between here and here. So if I wanted to measure, or if, or if I wanted to put onto the diagram 0 0.9 metres, it would be between this point over here and this point over here. OK, so let's just erase that little bit I did. There we are. And draw that double-headed arrow. There we go. One section, one head at either side. Draw a double-headed arrow to represent a distance of 0 0.9 metres. Nothing to say label it. So that's finished. The frequency of the wave is 750 hertz. Calculate the speed of the wave. All right, what do we know? We know C equals F lambda. Now we're given some information already, so C is then given by 750 hertz multiplied by the wavelength, which is 0 0.45 meters. And that will give us a value of 337.5 3, 
meters per second. So I'll just put in an answer here of 3, 40 meters per second. Um, something that comes up quite a lot, if you have a look in the mark scheme here, you'll see that it says the answer should be to two or three significant figures. So I'm just leaving this one as two significant figures. It doesn't really matter. I could go up to, to three significant figures, put 338. That'd probably be okay. But I'll leave it as two significant figures because it ties in nicely with what I know about the speed of sound in air. Which is interestingly enough what happens with part C, suggest a medium through which the sound is travelling in state of reasoning. Well, I know the speed of sound in air is about 340 meters per second. So our medium here would be air, the reason. The speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. There we go. D, another type of wave that consists of compressions and rarefactions is ultrasound. State one other similarity between sound of frequency 750 hertz and ultrasound. Well, they're both longitudinal waves. There you go, so both longitudinal waves. Next, two state one way in which sound of frequency 750 hertz is different from ultrasound. Well, you can hear 750 hertz because it's in the normal hearing range. It's below ultrasound. Ultrasound is everything above 20 kilohertz. There we go. So the frequency is below 20 kilohertz. Question 7. Figure 7.1 shows three identical lamps and an ammeter connected to a power supply. The switches are closed. Each lamp is rated at 60 watts and operates at its normal working voltage of 110 volts. So calculate A, the current in each lamp. Alright, what do we have? Well, looking here, we have the power and we have the voltage. As it's the normal working voltage of it, we would expect it to be the normal working current, so it should be working at 70, uh, sorry, 60 watts. So we need a, an equation that relates power and voltage with current. What do we know? We know that power equals current times voltage. So I'm going to take that equation here and rearrange it. And what I can do is I can rearrange that to get the current. Current is then just power divided by voltage. The power in this case is 60 watts divided by 110 volts. And that will give me an answer. Somewhere akin to 0 0.5454, blah, 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 blah. it goes on. I think the next one's 5, actually. There we are. It just continues on. Now I'm going to take that. I've got two significant figures here, one significant figure here. So I'll do it to two significant figures. That will give me 0 0.55 amps. 2. The current in the ammeter. Ooh. Okay, well, let's look at this. We will have the same current here as we do here, as we do here, because all of these switches are closed. It's part of the question. And it tells us that the total current here will be three times the value of one of these currents. Now we've already worked out the value. It was 60 watts divided by 110 volts, and it gave us this section here. Now we took that to two significant figures, and we got that as an answer. But this is to two significant figures. We want to find the current in the ammeter. We have to use the actual value in the calculation. It's important. That's why the calculation that was done, what was it, question two or three, when they rounded up in the middle of the question, that's why it was wrong, because you need to use the raw data. All right, so here we go. Let's calculate the current in the ammeter. It's going to be three times the current, three times 60 watts divided by 110 volts, which will give us an answer of 1.63636. Of course, we've got our one significant figure up here, two significant figures down there. So we want to have a final answer to two significant figures. And that will be 1.6 amps. There we go. Excellent. Part three, the voltage of the power supply. Now that answer is actually in the question. Let's come up here. Each of them is operating at its normal working voltage of 110 volts. That means across here and here is 110 volts. So the voltage of the power supply, which is the voltage across all those lamps there, is 110 volts. B. 
calculate the resistance of the filament of one of the lamps when working normally. Okay, interesting. What we know, we know the voltage across the lamp, and we know that V equals I R. We also calculated the current in the lamp, so we know both of those things. And we can calculate the resistance by simply voltage divided by current. Putting in the information that we have, it's 110 volts divided by 0 0.55 amps, and that will get us 200 ohms. There we go, 200 ohms. So for anyone who's rather curious why I've got 200 ohms rather than some uh, other number like 202, here we go, I'll show you why. We got the current here from 60 watts divided by 110 volts, if memory serves. So the total calculation would actually be 110 volts divided by 60 watts divided by 110 volts. And if you look at these figures, that's two significant figures, that's two significant figures, that's only one significant figure, so I should only give the final answer to two significant figures. And if I end up with an answer like 202, then that's actually going to be 200 ohms. That's why I'm using two significant figures there. And that's why the answer rounds down nicely like so. Two, another lamp X has a filament with twice the resistance of each lamp in the circuit of figure 7.1. The material and the temperature of the filament in lamp X is the same as the filaments in lamp 7.1. All right, in table 7.1, tick any box in the right hand column that shows a possible difference between the filament of lamp X and the filament of one of the lamps in the circuit. Okay, ah, so we get, let's assume that R is our normal resistance, we've suddenly ended up with a, a special bulb, another lamp labelled X, which is a resistance of 2R. And the question is, which one of these things would do it? X is half the length, we'd have half the resistance. If it's twice the length, yeah. Twice the length, because what you have to remember here is the resistance is proportional to length over cross-sectional area. So what does that mean? If I want 2R, I would need Either, either two times the length or one half times the area. That would work. So either or. Either two times the length or one half of the cross-sectional area. Right, so one quarter, nope. One half, yeah, that would do it. Two times the cross-section, nope. And uh, four times, no, not that either. Eight A one. Figure 8.1 shows a positive charged cube of insulating material. The cube is fixed to a piece of wood that's floating on water. Negatively charged rod is held above the piece of wood and is brought close to the cube. Right. State and explain any movement of the piece of wood. Now, what's going to happen? This is negative. This is positive. They are going to attract. So this piece of wood is going to move in that direction. So what's going to happen? Well it's going to move towards a negatively charged rod. Why? Because opposite charges attract. There we are. Part 2, figure 8.2 shows two cubes of insulating material. One is positively charged and the other is negatively charged. The cubes are fixed to a piece of wood that's floating on water and the charged rods are held over the piece of wood and brought close as shown. Okay. So looking at this image here, what's going to happen, these two are going to be attracted. So this is going to push in that direction. And these two on the other side here are going to be attracted. So this is going to push in this direction. What looks like it will happen is it looks like this will actually start spinning round because we've created some kind of turning effect. Ah, there we go. State and explain any movement of the piece of wood. Well, what do we know is going to happen? Well, the wood will spin or rotate. Um, because two forces from a charged material create a turning effect. B. In terms of a simple electron model, describe the differences between conductors and insulators. Right, let's come down and have a look at that. Ah, nice and straightforward. Conductors have a lot of uh, free electron, a large number of free conduction electrons able to move around. Insulators, the electrons are held in place. 
there we are. C. On figure 8.3, draw the electric field pattern around a single point positive charge. Hmm. Now, very important to remember that these field lines represent the direction of motion of a small positive charge. There we go. So a whole bunch of beautiful field lines and we expect the arrows to be pointing away from the positive charge. There we go. That's it. Question 9. Figure 9.1 shows a permanent bar magnet next to a circuit that contains a coil and a galvanometer. Suggest a material from which the magnet is made. Okay, well, it's holding its magnetism by itself. I think steel is a very good option here. Because steel can form a magnet and hold magnetism at room temperature. The magnet is moved to the left and inserted a small distance into the coil. The galvanometer deflects briefly and shows there is a current in the coil. Explain why there is a current in the coil. Okay, well what's happening here is the coil cuts the magnetic field lines around the bar magnet and that induces an EMF. There we go. So you could say inducing a voltage as well. Two, as the magnet is moving near to the coil, NQ of the coil behaves as a magnetic pole. State the polarity of NQ and explain why it has this polarity. Okay, so is it north or south? Whenever you have this situation, a magnetic field is being induced because of a moving magnet. The magnetic field that's created works in such a way to try and attempt to stop the movement of the magnet. So if this is moving this way, then it will try to prevent it moving that way by creating a a force to push backwards. And the only way it can do that is if it makes that a north and this a south. And then it will try and push against that other magnet to stop it moving. To try and oppose that motion. So NQ is a magnetic north pole. It opposes the approach of the north pole of the magnet. C suggests two ways in which the deflection of the galvanometer can be reversed. Okay, first of all, the magnetic fields there move the north, magnetic north in the opposite direction. Then it will suddenly try and, it will become a south to try and prevent the magnet from moving away. Um, other thing that could happen is you could move the north pole towards the other end. Move the magnet around completely, move the north pole towards the other end. Or you could move the south pole in the same direction as the magnet is. So there we go, move magnet in the opposite direction, insert north pole in the other end. Another option, of course, would be uh, move the south pole in the same direction as the north pole is currently moving. Question 10. A detector of ionising radiation measures the background count rate in a classroom where there are no radioactive samples present. The readings in counts per minute taken over a long period of time, or sorry, taken over a period of time, are shown in table 10.1. State two possible sources of this background radiation. Well, you got a whole bunch of cosmic rays from space. That's one possibility. Um, another possibility, medical sources. You could also get it from rocks, from radon gas. So let's put in a couple of them. So cosmic rays, medical sources, that's fine. Explain why the readings are not the same. Well, because we get random variation in background radiation. Same as you get random variation in any radiation being released. So random variation of background radiation. B. With no radioactive sample present, a scientist records a background radiation count of 40 counts per minute. He brings a radioactive sample close to the detector. The count rate increases to 200 counts a minute. After 24 days, the count rate is 50 counts per minute. Calculate the half-life of the radioactive sample. All right, first things first, let's calculate the initial radioactivity of the actual sample. So it's the difference between the total amount of radiation detected minus 
the background radiation. So 200 minus 40 gives me 160 counts per minute. Now the final radiation ends up being 50. It's going to be 50 minus 40. It'll be 10 counts per minute. So now we want to do a little table of the radioactive count and the half-lives. And now we can look at how many half-lives we're going through after 24 days. So our initial count is 160 counts per minute and half-life zero. Then I'll go to 80 with one half-life, 40 with two half-lives, 20 with three half-lives and 10 with four half-lives, which is what's happening over here. Starts off at 160, ends up at 10. So we know that it's undergone four half-lives. So 24 days equals four half-lives. Then one half-life must equal six days. There we go, and remember the unit. C. Draw a line between each type of ionising radiation and its property, and another line between the property and its use. One has been done for you. OK. So let's look at the property and see what we match it with. Uh, it is the most ionising radiation most easily absorbed uh, by very small amounts of substance. With that very first one there, that's alpha particle radiation, so alpha radiation. Uh, penetration is affected by small changes in the amount of solid it passes through. Well, that'll be beta particles. Uh, it is highly penetrating and poorly ionizing. That's gamma rays. Okay. Now let's look at the use. Remotely detecting leaks in underground water pipes. We need people to go through a lot of ground. The thing that's best for traveling through objects is gamma rays. Detecting smoke in a fire alarm system. Well, that is alpha particles. Finally, detecting a change in the thickness of aluminium foil during its manufacture. That's beta particles. There we go. All right, good job. If you found that useful, if you liked it, please feel free to like and subscribe. And if you have any comments, please Leave them in the comment section underneath. You know what? Have a great day.